Okay, I think we're going to get started. Um, welcome to Cardiology Grand Rounds, October 31st, Halloween 2022. Um, we have what I will be, I, I believe will be a very uh, enthusiastic, energetic conversation today. Um, I just want to go over a few of the housekeeping issues with regards to CMEs. Um, as you know, uh, we do have the Cardiology Grand Rounds. You can find it on our YouTube channel um, that's listed below for the RWJMS Division of Cardiovascular Diseases. So if you've missed any of the Grand Rounds in the past, feel free to go ahead and um, log on there. As for CMEs, uh, this session, uh, you need to first text 14283 to the number listed below. We will also put that in the chat box. This needs to be done through an SMS uh, message within 12 hours after the session, not an iMessage if using the iOS operating platform, 14283. And to obtain maintenance of certification points, complete step one, uh, you will answer a brief quiz using the room code FUTURE29, FUTURE29. Uh, you can scan that barcode or you could go to the website that's listed below. Again, uh, this will be in the chat box uh, so that you may consider doing it during today's presentation. Um, I would like to uh, welcome uh, Dr. Uh, Pankaj Madan, who is, specializes in adult congenital heart disease. Uh, he is the founder and the medical director of the South Texas Adult Congenital Heart Center and the Cardiovascular Genetics Clinic at Methodist Hospital in San Antonio, Texas. Um, I was pleasantly surprised when I reviewed his CV. He also at one point in his prior life was a medical director at the Center for Adults with Congenital Heart Disease at North Beth Israel Hospital uh, and the Children's Hospital of New Jersey. So there is a connection to New Jersey. Uh, he did his internal medicine training at Baylor College of Medicine his cardiovascular disease fellowship at the University of Washington, where he then went on to obtain a master's of science in epidemiology in the School of Public Health at the University of Washington. Uh, he completed his fellowship in adult congenital heart disease at the Mayo Clinic uh, and is one of, of the earlier um, physicians to obtain board certification and complete a formal fellowship in adult congenital heart disease. Uh, he specializes first and foremost in the care of patients with adult congenital heart disease, uh, but a good portion of his career has been spent both in the education and program development in this field. Uh, he's received multiple awards and grants and has had multiple presentations at the American Heart Association and the American College of Cardiology sessions. He also fondly does a boot camp in his area on adult congenital heart disease for the fellows. And he will be speaking to us about atrial septal defects. I'd also like to uh, introduce Dr. Kenneth Dolnawan. As you know, Dr. Dolnawan is a, an assistant professor of medicine uh, in the division of cardiology in the section of advanced heart failure and transplant. Uh, when Dr. Madan is finished, uh, we will open things up to questions. I would encourage you to ask your questions in the chat box, which I will be following. I think the more questions we have, the more robust the discussion will be. Dr. Madan, thank you. Welcome. And uh, we're glad to have you. The floor is yours. Thank you for the introduction, Dr. Altabelli. So I am going to share my screen. Um, and, uh, you know, this presentation is highly inspired by the Fellows Bootcamp that I hold annually here in our area. And it's a very interactive presentation. Uh, at least at my end, we are having some issues, but uh, I would, this is, this is supposed to be, um, you know, audience response uh, stuff. So uh, go ahead and uh, text my name 00099222333 uh, to join in on the audience response system and submit your responses so that we can get used to it. And then we will go forward. <clears throat> 
All right, all done? Hopefully. Okay. All right, let's move on. Uh, we will have this same message when we do the questions again. So I'm going to talk about atrial septal defects, and we are going to talk about uh, several of the things that I see in my own clinical practice. And these are uh, pearls of wisdom. I see um, things like this happening all the time in my practice, and hopefully we can uh, look at some of the pitfalls in the diagnosis and management of atrial septal defect and incorporate those uh, pearls of wisdom into our own practices and your practice. So uh, there are no financial disclosures. Off-label use of devices will be discussed during this presentation, and uh, I will point that out. Um, so atrial septal defect is a hole between the left atrium and right atrium. And since the pressure on the left side of the heart is higher on, uh, than the right side, the blood flows from the left side to the right side, causing right-sided chamber enlargement. It is a form of pre-tricuspid shunt. So it involves enlargement of both RA and RV. Uh, physiology is also similar in anomalous pulmonary venous connection. So here is uh, the first patient. Uh, you are doing a clinic and then you receive a phone call in which you are asked to interpret hemodynamics of a 30-year-old male, male with atrial septal defect. Uh, the oxygen saturations are provided. Superior vena cava 65%, IVC 65%, RA 87%, PA 87%, aorta 98%. Systemic cardiac output by FIC equation is 5 liters per minute. And uh, the pressures are RA8, RV60 by 8, PA pressure 60 by 25 with a mean of 40, pulmonary capillary wedge pressure 10, aorta 126 by 70. So what is the QP slash QS and pulmonic valve, uh, pulmonary valve resistance, uh, I'm sorry, pulmonary artery, pulmonary vascular resistance? So I'm going to let this slide up for a few minutes so that um, you can calculate uh, these two uh, items. Okay, let's go ahead and uh, submit these responses now. Okay, so, so far, 50% uh, of the people have chose it correctly. Um, 25 and 50% have picked up the wrong answers. So go ahead, let's, uh, uh, let's move forward. So will you advise closing the ASD? Yes is A, no is B. Okay, so on my screen, I see 50% yes, 50% no. So 
let's talk about hemodynamics calculation a little bit. Um, so norm, in a normal circulation, we know that the pulmonic uh, cardiac output is equal to the systemic cardiac output. Um, but in the shunt, that is no longer the case. In the presence of a systemic shunt, I mean, in presence of a simple shunt, the pulmonic uh, cardiac output is much higher than the uh, systemic cardiac output because of the presence of the shunt. All the blood is going to the right side and the right side is seeing excessive blood flow. So if you want to calculate QP slash QS, uh, then it would be 98 minus 65 divided by 98 minus 87. The 98 is the systemic oxygen saturation and 65 is the SVC saturation. And uh, in the denominator is the uh, systemic saturation minus the mixed saturation after the shunt. So that calculates it out to be three is to one. And then uh, we know that resistance is uh, a pressure difference times the uh, divided by the flow. The main uh, problem that happens that I see from the cardiologist referrals is that they often use the cardiac output, the systemic cardiac output as the flow, but they should be using the output across the pulmonary circuit because we are calculating resistance across the uh, pulmonary circuit. So that would be 40 minus 10, but you have to multiply the uh, five liters that I showed you by three because the QP by QS was three. So the calculated pulmonic vascular resistance is two wood units, not six wood units, as and that would have been an incorrect choice. So um, do not substitute QP with QS when you are calculating pulmonic vascular resistance. Um, you could do that if there is no shunt, which is commonly done in the cath lab. But when you're dealing with the shunts, uh, calculate the pulmonic flow by taking into account QPQS. Okay. All right. So let's review the guidelines when to close an atrial septal defect. I have shown both ESC 2020 and uh, American College of Cardiology 2018 guidelines. Uh, the bottom line is that the atrial septal defect should be closed if QP slash QS is more than 1.5 and your pulmonic vascular resistance is less than five units, five wood units. Um, and in this patient, it was two wood units. And of course, the pulmonic artery pressure is less than 50% of systemic systolic pressure. So that's uh, uh, class one or class two A indication to close an atrial septal defect. Okay. So then the next question is, how do we close the atrial septal defects? And that depends on the type of the atrial septal defect uh, that is under consideration. In your practice, majority of the atrial septal defects are going to be of secundum type, which is 80% of the atrial septal defects. It is important to note that 10% of the secundum atrial septal defects are associated with partial anomalous pulmonary venous return. So you should be on a lookout for those. Um, and, uh, and if the patient needs surgery, uh, then the patient should be appropriately be sent for surgery for correction of both defects. Uh, the way to recognize how these patients present in our clinic is that the patient had an atrioceptal defect occluded by an MPLATS device and still continues to have right-sided uh, chamber enlargement. And then we reassess, and then we often figure out that there is an anomalous pulmonary venous circuit that is causing um, an additional shunt. 85% of the secundum atrial septal defects can be closed percutaneously. And that determination is um, often done on the basis of a transesophageal echocardiogram uh, with the uh, addition of 3D uh, echocardiography. Okay, let's talk about the primum atrial septal defect. Uh, in the primum atrial septal defect, these are 10% of the atrial septal defects, and the defect is uh, uh, located uh, inferiorly. In fact, both the mitral valve and tricuspid valve are at the same level, as shown in the uh, adjacent picture. Um, and uh, this kind of defect is often associated with mitral valve abnormality and most common of which is a cleft mitral valve. 
and this defect can only re be repaired by surgery, not any uh, percutaneous intervention. Then let's talk about a lesser common uh, atrial septal defect, which is uh, which is often associated with partial normless pulmonary venous return and is called the sinus venosus atrial septal defect, often diagnosed uh, on a CT scan. So this is the superior vena cava, and uh, and the superior vena cava is going is getting pulmonary venous blood flow, and when it comes here, over here, there's a large part of the septum missing. Uh, that is in relation to the SVC, and that's the sinus venosus atrial septal defect. So um, I will play it one more time. There we go. So superior vena cava, that's the brighter structure because it has a lot of contrast. It's going to receive a pulmonary, right upper pulmonary vein here. And as it enters, there is a defect between the in the intraatrial septum, and uh, that is the cause of the right-sided chamber enlargement in this patient. Okay, so majority of these defects are also uh, require surgical closure. Uh, there has been some case reports in which some modified uh, covered stents have been used, uh, but that's uh, beyond uh, the discussion for today's uh, conference. Um, then let's review another form of rare atrial septal defect. This is a standard echo board question or um, an adult congenital heart disease board question. So I'm going to play this video for you. This is a parasternal view of the transthoracic echocardiogram. Uh, there is right-sided chamber enlargement, left atrium, and uh, over here behind in the left atrium is uh, dilated uh, the coronary sinus suggestive of um, left-sided SVC, which is very commonly seen in patients with coronary sinus. The contrast is being injected into the left arm so that it can travel from the left SVC to the coronary sinus. And note, as the bubbles come through, it's the left atrium that gets filled first. And then, of course, it goes to the right atrium. And this is where the coronary sinus has a hole and it fills the left atrium first, and then the blood goes to the right side. Um, so that's what a coronary sinus defect looks like, and this is, again, also to be repaired by surgery alone. Okay. All right, let's discuss a second patient, and this patient is a 51-year-old female. Um, she presented with shortness of breath. Um, there is right-sided chamber enlargement um, right there, um, and there is significant uh, tricuspid valve regurgitation. We did a transesophageal echocardiogram. We found a secundum atrial septal defect of about 2.2 centimeters, uh, which was suitable for closure, but uh, we didn't close it because uh, we did the cardiac catheterization, and the RV pressure was 117 by 10. 120 by 42, uh, so the PA pressures were higher than the uh, LV pressures. Uh, the pulmonary vascular resistance calculated out to be 18 wood units. The QP slash QS ratio was 1.1. Surprisingly, the patient was not cyanotic. She had a 95% oxygen saturation at rest. Okay, so what is your recommendation based upon the cardiac catheterization and numbers that you uh, just saw and the images that you just saw? So go ahead and send me your responses. So the choices are close the atrial septal defect. Number two, initiate pulmonary vasodilator therapy. I said no pulmonary vasodilator therapy and no closure. Okay, so 33% of you have said initial initiate pulmonary vasodilator therapy. Uh, about 67% of you said 
no pulmonary vasodilator therapy and no closure indicated. All right. Um, so actually in these patients, what we do is that we initiate pulmonary vasodilator therapy and she was started on uh, dual pulmonary vasodilator therapy with uh, mesitentin and tadalafil and her cardiac catheterization was repeated six months after therapy. And this time the mean PA pressure was 49, LV and diastolic pressure was 12. Uh, the QP slash QS ratio was 1.9 and pulmonary vascular resistance has declined from 18 wood units to 4.6 wood units. So what would be your recommendation now? Close the AST, uh, continue pulmonary vasodilator therapy, do both. Uh, partially close the ASD and continue the pulmonary vasodilator therapy. So, all right, let me hear uh, your responses. So 33% chose the option C, close the AST and continue pulmonary vasodilator therapy. 67% of you chose uh, partially close the AST and continue pulmonary vasodilator therapy. So to be honest, both of those options could be true. Um, the, the management, optimal management for strategy for these patients is uh, currently evolving in the field of adult congenital heart disease. And uh, uh, this is a device that is being used for partial closure of the atrial septal defect. It looks like an amplatzer, but it has a hole in the middle. And uh, you know, this is something that's only used for off-label use, and it's not available in the United States. So that's uh, another partial closure of atrial septal defect. That's the device to use. Um, so this patient uh, underwent... Uh, closure of the atrial septal defect with the finasterated ASD device. And I'm showing the pre and the post uh, RV pressures. So before treatment, the RV systolic pressure was close to 140. And after the treatment, uh, uh, after the, the device went in a month after that, the RV, SP, RV systolic pressures had declined to about 65. So half of what we started with. Similarly, uh, the RV dimensions had improved. Here is the device. The RV is now much smaller and the tricuspid valve regurgitation is no longer severe as I had shown you in the earlier images. Um, so this strategy is called treat and repair strategies. The basic premise of this strategy is that pulmonary vasodilators lead to reduce pulmonary vascular resistance and reduced pulmonary vascular resistance leads to reduction in the pulmonary pressures, which causes an increased shunt from the left to right, uh, not the right to left, left to right, and thus causes right-sided chamber enlargement. And if you close the shunt at that time, the RA and RV start shrinking with favorable remodeling of uh, right ventricle long-term. And this strategy um, is best studied in an article from China. This was a single chamber study in which about 56 patients who had resting uh, PA pressures of 70 with pulmonary vascular resistance of more than five wood units um, uh, underwent cardiac catheterization um, at baseline, which is this uh, bar on the left side. And after targeted medical therapy with dual pulmonary vasodilator therapy that led to reduction of about 15 millimeters in the systolic PA pressures. And then finally, um, and a 20.5 millimeter reduction after the closure was done um, with a finasterated ASD. Uh, 
Similarly, the RV dimensions actually um, got bigger after targeted medical therapy as the left to right shunt worsened with pulmonary vasodilator therapy. But once the defect was closed with a finasterated AST occluder device, the RV dimensions reduced from the baseline. So the long-term outcomes of treat and repair strategy remain unknown. We know that this strategy has good short-term outcomes. And we also realize that majority of the patients will likely continue to need pulmonary vasodilator therapy. We hope that the pulmonary vasodilator therapy will ne not need to be escalated in the future or the pulmonary vasodilator therapy requirements may stabilize after this therapy. Um, but the data remains to be seen. So, so let's see what the guidelines say. So if you look at the ESC 2020 guidelines, uh, they say that uh, finasterated ASD closure in patients with pulmonic vascular resistance of more than five wood units that improves to less than five wood units on pulmonary vasodilator therapy with QP slash QS more than 1.5. So if the patient had pulmonary hypertension to begin with and their pulmonary vascular resistance was more than five units and after the therapy, it declines to less than five, then you should partially close the atrial septal defect. If you look at the American College of Cardiology guidelines, they do not recommend the finasterated AST or closure device, probably because the device is not available here. But they do say that if you encounter such a patient, um, this patient uh, should be referred uh, to the adult congenital heart disease and pulmonary hypertension experts for further opinion and management. Okay. It is also important to realize when not to close and the patient's uh, HS after the effect should not be closed if there is resting cyanosis and there is elevated pulmonary vascular resistance despite pulmonary vasodilator therapy. And these are the patients who we call as uh, patients with Eisenmenger syndrome. I'm going to spend a few minutes talking about pulmonary vasodilator therapy and uh, the management of Eisenmenger uh, patients. So pulmonary vasodilator therapy, three broad classes, endothelin receptor antagonist, of which bosentin was the first drug, and then embrisentin and mesitentin are other additions. Uh, phosphodiesterase 5 inhibitors, sildenafil was the initial drug, and now the long-acting tadalafil is uh, available. Similarly, prostenoids can be IV and oral, which is silexipeg. So uh, pulmonary vasodilator therapy, again, the guidelines differ. Um, the American College of Cardiology and American Heart Association guidelines uh, mention that the First, the drug should be initiated as a monotherapy, and if one agent does not lead to improvement, add another sequentially. The ESC 2020 guidelines recommend combination therapy upfront, which is what our, our practice has been as well to initiate a dual pulmonary vasodilator therapy upfront. Um, always look out for iron deficiency. Uh, remember that these patients are cyanotic. Uh, their hemoglobin levels may be higher than normal individuals, but they still may have iron deficiency and their hemoglobin response may not be appropriate for the level of cyanosis. So therefore, uh, important to check them periodically uh, for uh, iron, TIBC, and ferritin and, and treat appropriately. Treating of Treatment of iron deficiency is uh, important because if there is iron deficiency, it reduces RBC survival time, reduces RBC oxygen carrying capacity. The RBCs become too rigid, causes increased blood viscosity, and can lead to strokes. Treatment is with iron supplementation for about six weeks and recheck the iron stores again. Important not to overshoot either. And uh, the treatment with iron supplementation should be discontinued when the iron levels are replete. Other things that shouldn't be done, which are often done, is to avoid routine phlebotomies. It happens quite a bit. Somebody's hemoglobin is 19 or 20 or 21, and uh, the patient is often being seen by the hematologist, and they are periodically getting phlebotomies. Um, not to be done. It causes iron deficiency anemia, 
um, causes stroke. Avoid transvenous devices or wires in patients with um, Eisenwenger syndrome because these transvenous devices and strokes can develop thrombi on them. And uh, through the open shunt, uh, these thrombi can travel to the systemic circulation and cause stroke. Avoid routine anticoagulation or aspirin use. Um, so avoid on a routine basis, but let's say if they have uh, some evidence of thrombi or uh, uh, atrial arrhythmias, then these can be used. Um, and, uh, and we should routinely, routine avoid anticoagulation or aspirin use should be avoided because Eisenmenger syndrome is both a procoagulant state and a bleeding state. So, it, you know, it, it goes one way or the other. Let's talk about another patient of mine. Uh, this was a 71-year-old male uh, who initially presented with paroxysmal atrial fibrillation. He had pedal edema and shortness of breath. The past medical history was significant for Crohn's disease, uh, small bowel obstruction and GI bleeding, hypertension. He had history of sleep apnea and was on CPAP, had hyperlipidemia, and we did all the investigations. He had right-sided chamber enlargement. Again, no surprises, there was a second atrial septal defect, and uh, we determined that it was suitable for percutaneous closure. The RV systolic pressure as measured by the TR velocity was 28 millimeters mercury, okay? All right, so what is the next best step? There is no choices there. You will have to uh, type in your, uh, uh, send a text message. What would you do? Right heart cath, okay. There's only one option. There's only one a message from here. No electrophysiologists in the group. There is paroxysmal atrial fibrillation there too. Okay, so I I have gotten only one response, and it was a right heart catheterization. Okay. All right, then um, let's move on. Other people do not want to commit to it. Okay. All right, let's move on then. So um, I'm going to talk about what we did with this patient later on, but let's review the natural history of atrial septal defect. So atrial septal defect kills. Um, this is a historical data on unoperated atrial septal defect. The top uh, orange line is uh, the healthy subject's uh, survival. And the bottom green line is the survival of patients with atrial septal defect. So as the patient gets older, uh, the atrial septal defect is associated with a higher mortality. And at about 70 years of age, only um, maybe less than 10% of the patients with atrial septal defect uh, are alive, okay? Uh, the clinical symptoms increase, increasingly progress after 40 years of age. When you are less than 40, majority of the patients are in NYHA class one or NYHA class two. But as you get older, after 40 years of age, um, uh, the, the curve starts shifting. And by 60 years of age, majority of the patients are in the NYHA uh, three and higher. The atrial flutter and fibrillation is rare in younger patients with atrial septal defect, uh, hardly anything, but after 40 to 60 years, the atrial fibrillation and incidence of atrial arrhythmia starts uh, rising quite a bit. Um, as the patients grow older, the systemic pulmonary artery pressures also begin to rise, and there's a pretty steep rise after somewhere at about 50 to 60 years of age. Uh, 
and this uh, systemic uh, i'm sorry systolic pulmonary artery pressure rise is not only driven by the shunt uh, in with excessive blood flow into the pulmonary arteries but it is also being driven by increased ventricular stiffness uh, from the diastolic dysfunction which occurs as a person ages if these if if you close an atrial septal defect um, um, in a patient then even if the patient is older they may start with a higher pulmonary artery pressure but they do exhibit a decline uh, three months after uh, closing the atrial septal defect the other patients who are younger they have somewhat elevated pa pressures too and they their pa pressures often normalize after the atrial septal defect uh, is closed at about three months uh, follow-up similarly the RV sizes are much higher in patients who are elderly, but they do decline once the uh, ASD is closed with uh, percutaneous intervention and their RV sizes go down. Um, the, the younger patients have less, uh, less uh, big sizes to begin with and they also decline and their curves also decline showing reduction in RV sizes. Um, this graph shows the uh, patients in the different NYHA classes uh, at different ages. Note that pre-intervention in patients with age uh, who are more than 60 years of age, only 12% of the patients um, are in NYHA class and a lot of patients are in the NYHA 2 or 3. After the intervention, um, it helps in symptomatic improvement with um, a very high proportion of patients becoming NYHA class 1 after intervention. So other consideration for atrial septal defect in elderly, atrial septal defect closure can unmask or worsen diastolic dysfunction in elderly. Um, so uh, because the Elevated LV and diastolic pressure uh, is can be spuriously low in a patient with atrial septal defect because the blood is shunting uh, from the atria to from the left atrium to the right atrium, and if you close the atrial septal defect, uh, you will often notice uh, worsening or increasing LV and diastolic pressure. Um, you know, I have you know we do not hold. Uh, the closure back if there is a such slight elevation in LV and diastolic pressure we just treat those patients with diuretics and hope that things do get better but expect to treat them with diuretics uh, if you are going to close an atrial septal defect in an elderly individual so expect the diastolic function to get worse so um, I have shown you earlier that patients with atrial septal defect are prone to atrial arrhythmias so if you close the hole less uh, in a younger individual less let's say less than 40 years of age their risk of atrial fibrillation is the same as any other healthy individual um, uh, who does not have an atrial septal defect but if you close the atrial septal defect later in life let's say more than 40 years of age or 50 years of age the risk increased risk of atrial fibrillation persists and those patients need to be carefully monitored and uh, it's you know whenever you deal with an elderly patient with atrial septal defect who has uh, atrial fibrillation consider atrial fibrillation ablation first because after you close the hole uh, you will not be able to put an ablation catheter across and uh, do ablation you should also assess the patient for uh, their bleeding risk using the has blood score and in our patient he already had Crohn's disease and bowel obstruction and consider them for uh, watchman devices if indicated prior to closure of atrial septal defect so that is what we did uh, we consulted electrophysiology we got the ablation done and the watchman device in place and a few weeks later we closed the hole with the um, with the septal occluder device so 
uh, this was uh, the uh, the question that I sent you for CME. So let's uh, see, and I, I hope I get a 100% response and 100% correct rate on this one. So what is false about percutaneous AST closure in older individuals? Improve symptoms, can make diastolic failures, improves mortality outcome, does not affect risk of atrial fibrillation onset. And I got a 100% response on that it improves, like it does not improve mortality. And most of the things that we do in adult congenital heart disease uh, they have never been shown to improve mortality and atrial septal defect closure is no expect no exceptions. We know that it improves symptoms, but we do not know whether closing the hole in elderly is going to Im improve their mortality. Okay, so uh, to summarize, accurate calculation and assessment of hemodynamics is of paramount importance. Refer patients with severe pulmonary hypertension to specialized ACHD pulmonary hypertension programs and multidisciplinary management of ASD may be needed in patients with pulmonary arterial hypertension uh, or those who are elderly. I think that's it. Thank you, Dr. Madan. Um, very, uh, very good uh, talk about ASD. So I'm going to bring in Ken Dolnew on. I'm actually going to start off with a question less about the hemodynamics, but the risk of paradoxical uh, embolization. Mm -hmm. Um, we know that the, you know, the evidence for closing ASDs is, is largely from randomized trials in patients with PFO and cryptogenic stroke. Yes. We see that uh, there's a, a, a reduction in the recurrent risk of stroke after PFO closure with medical therapy. What, what, do, you, what do you have to say about ASDs relative to PFOs? And then a, a, a subset question of that are women who are pregnant with moderate-sized um, atrial septal defects because they certainly are at risk from developing uh, embolization from leg or pelvic vein DVTs um, mm -hmm. that could uh, occur during pregnancy. So two questions. I'm going to answer the second question first. Um, the risk of um, uh, or the need for anticoagulation in patients who are pregnant and who have an atrial septal defect. So a moderate size atrial septal defect uh, with RA and RV enlargement, as long as the function is great, is well tolerated hemodynamically uh, during uh, pregnancy. And most of the patients can carry uh, the, the fetuses or the infants to term. Uh, the question is um, what happens during the peripartum period uh, or even before that, what needs to be done uh, or, or if anything needs to be done to prevent any uh, stroke risk uh, and after during that time. So our practice has been to give them atrial, to give them a baby aspirin from second and third uh, trimester onwards. Uh, it achieves two things. It reduces the risk of any DVT, and it also is protective against a preeclampsia, um, which is sort of very common in patients with uh, congenital heart disease uh, undergoing pregnancy. During the uh, during the peripartum period, we ask that you know at least a DVT prophylaxis with uh, uh, the Lovenox, uh, which is a standard forty milligrams subcutaneously, should be started uh, in every single patient but we are not uh, doing full therapeutic anticoagulation in patients who otherwise have a really uncomplicated atrial septal defect. And the first question was uh, that in patients with cryptogenic stroke, the pendulum has swung to the other side where uh, PFO uh, is now actually thought to be, you know, after do doing all the evaluation and if you are truly uh, and if you truly think that that's a cryptogenic stroke, then the PFO closure is indicated. The same, same thing also applies to an atrial septal defect that if you have a cryptogenic stroke, and even if your atrial septal defect is small, we do advocate a closure of the atrial septal defect as well. Good. Thank you for those response. I, I just received a reminder, if you could stop sharing your presentation at this point. Oh, okay. Okay. Ken, you want yes. to jump in? 
Sure. Hey, Dr. Mada, and thanks for that very uh, thorough talk about ASD. Actually, I have a couple of questions. Um, when you decide as to when to close or not, does it play into your thought process as to whether the pH is mostly driven by, say, PAH as opposed to a post-capillary process in what you see in the elderly patients? I'm sorry, say, say that again. I'm sorry, I just got So the, the etiology of the pH, it could be different. It could be pH for your younger patients as opposed to post-capillary for those people with stiff ventricles. Correct. That's your typical hyperkinetic pH associated with a shunt yes. in the ASD. Does the type of pH play into your decision-making process as to which one needs closure with therapy as opposed to just therapy alone? Yes. So what you're saying is that the pulmonary artery hypertension can be multifactorial in a patient with an atrial septal defect. It can be a result of uh, increased pulmonary blood flow through the pulmonary vasculature, and then it could be a true uh, WHO gr group 1 PAH, or it could be uh, from the left-sided disease in an elderly with a patient uh, who has uh, a, you know, ventricular dysfunction, and that may be causing the PAH as well. Yeah. So the management strategies in both those forms will be different. Um, you will, uh, you know, obviously a cardiac catheterization is essential to distinguish those types of um, uh, different forms of pulmonary hypertension. Um, so, you know, if you find elevated LV and diastolic pressures, and your PAH is, uh, and your pulmonary pressures are way out of uh, VAC that are not, or you can have a mixed etiology too. So, you know, it can go both ways. So um, if it is predominantly driven by LVEDP, sure, do the diuretics, you know, um, then, you know, most likely the atrial septal defect may be a secondary issue. Also realize that most of the pulmonary hypertension in atrial septal defect is usually caused by uh, defects that are larger than one centimeter in size, okay? So if you have a small defect, you know, 0.8 centimeter, and that happens in our clinic too, and the patient is extremely short of breath and there's a pulmonary hypertension, it's most likely not related to the, to the atrial septal defect in, and in fact, closing that 0.8 centimeter close and the atrial septal defect is probably going to harm the patient because that's how you're decompressing yeah. the RA and RV to the left side. So um, versus it's a two centimeter hole, then you'd start thinking, okay, maybe there is some <laughs> etiology of uh, pulmonary hypertension that's originating from the large hole. So accurate hemodynamic assessment, uh, treat with diuretics if there's elevated and diastolic pressure, uh, look at the size, and um, and then go from there. It's it's um, you know it's a discussion. So, so uh, if I could jump in, um, you know, so for patients with mixed etiology for their pH, and you're trying to figure out, you know, the the severity in your lab, do you do test balloon occlusion of the ASD? And, yes, we do. And does that yeah. and, and how often does that help to discern um, and help guide you uh, for closure? Um, you know, we do that routinely, but it has rarely been helpful um, because the patients, uh, I mean, if you have an EDP that's like 14 or 15, which is ar already marginal, and if you test occlude the atrial septal defect and suddenly it jumps to 25, you know that the LV and diastolic pressure is the predominant or, or the diastolic dysfunction is the predominant etiology. But, you know, majority of the time um, for the patients that we are getting in our clinic, it hardly jumps by maybe two millimeters or so. And then we know, okay, you know, two millimeters or three millimeters is fine. I mean, it's not the most uh, highest contributor to the PA pressures uh, that way. So, My other question, Dr. Madan, is I'm sure you run into this issue every now and then. When you have a discrepant finding between your echo in your hemodynamics. When you have an echo showing a clearly large QPQS, clearly large ASD, but for some reason you keep on repeating your right heart cath, you just don't get the hemodynamics that you think that heart has. What do you, you know, know it's, it's the bane of my existence because the cardiac MRI gives me different QPQS ratios. The interventional guys give me 
yeah. different QPQS ratios. And, um, you know, for those of the people who believe in echo derived QPQS ratios, those are might be different. Um, here is here is the rule of thumb that I use. OK, uh, I do not trust the echo derived QP slash QS ratios. OK, so I throw them out of the window. Uh, the 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 only thing that I care about, and I think that the atrial septal defect is hemodynamically stable if there is unequivocal right-sided chamber enlargement. If there is an enlarged RA and enlarged RB, even if uh, the interventional guys call me that say that QP slash QS is one is one point two to one, I know that that is not true. So. I use that as the objective measure of a significant shunt rather than uh, relying on the numbers. The numbers, if they support my theory, I take them. If they don't, then I <laughs> discard them. <laughs> That's good. Uh, I can't hear you. I think uh, you're muted. Thank you. As somebody who dabbles in sports cardiology, can you tell us a little bit about participation in sports in patients with ASDs and mild degrees of pulmonary hypertension? Uh, the mild degrees of pulmonary hypertension um, uh, is somebody that you define as uh, RV pressures or the PA pressures below 50? Mm -hmm. Okay. So the textbook or the guideline directed answer is that uh, they shouldn't be participating in sports, but the true answer shouldn't be, uh, you know, derived by like any any particular number of the pulmonary hypertension. So we, you know, we have a shared, we follow a shared decision making model, and we want to know what kind of uh, sports do they want to participate in? Are they trying to participate in uh, recreational sports, or are they going to participate in? Uh, uh, in, in the sports that are high intensity. Then we also want to know whether their atrial septal defect is something that can be closed and maybe whatever their RV pressures can, they are, can be reversed or not. So those are the things that I would uh, look for. Can we fix this? And then you do not have any um, um, limitation afterwards, or is it somebody that we cannot fix but then they, they would have more higher uh, PA pressures if we decide that this is not a fixable uh, patient. Um, so, you know, those, those are the things that, that would play in our mind. Sometimes patients that we close um, develop some mild form of pulmonary hypertension later in adulthood. <clears throat> And then we are looking for what are the etiologies of those? I mean, is it obesity? Is it um, some sort of obstructive sleep apnea? So all all those etiologies uh, play a role, and uh, and you know, and it depends upon the underlying cause and and how how to address them and what can be done to fix them. So, in general, um, aerobic activity, moderate exercise, nobody is preventing anybody from doing those. And if we did here in the United States have access to the fenestrated uh, septal occlusion device. How do you think that would impact your practice based on your experience? So, you know, we had one patient and it was um, a hassle to get it done um, because the hospital had to give special privileges to do the device. The FDA had to um, approve the device. Um, and then hospital was, you know, the insurance company wouldn't pay the bill for an investigational device. So there were a lot of uh, things that we loops that we had to jump through to get a finasterated AST occluded device. But I think uh, patients in H with HS septal defect are in a spectrum. One are slam dunk closure, you know, just uh, right side chamber enlargement, um, not very high PA pressures, low pulmonary vascular resistances. And on the, on the other side are the patients who are cyanotic and who we know that shouldn't have the atrial septal defect closed. And in the middle are these patients who are in uh, uh, in varying degrees of progression from uh, less complicated to the most complicated on whom the pulmonary vasodilator therapies can work and, uh, and reduce the pressures. And in those patients, I think having a device like that uh, has the potential to change their 
um, uh, natural history of progression. So, you know, I think it may become more mainstream because if it is approved in Europe, I'm sure there'll be more outcomes based data that will be generated and hopefully um, that will help uh, in, in the approval of this device, uh, maybe later at some point in United States as well. Good. Um, you know, thank you for, first of all, Ken, thank you, but uh, thank you for the answers to these questions. I mean, this is an area that continues to evolve and right. in our institution, we are doing, uh, you know, septal occlusions, um, but you gave us a lot of food to, for thought um, in terms of guidelines for closure um, in, you know, in terms of also the impact it does have on the natural history of the patient. And I think that's a key take home point for both myself and, and everyone who is listening to today's talk. So we'd like to thank you for joining us. Um, uh, it was our pleasure to host you. Um, and, uh, you know, for those of you uh, who haven't, didn't catch the whole presentation, uh, please feel free to log on to our YouTube channel for RWJMS. Dr. Madonna, on behalf of Rutgers, Robert Wood, we thank you for joining us um, and we appreciate it. And hopefully our paths cross again in the future. Of course. Thank you so much. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.